Hebrews, the 10th chapter, we want to start by talking about the idea of how the blood of Christ and the salvation of the sinner are involved. I doubt that there's very many who believe that Jesus uh, exists, that he is the one who's the Son of God, who would not admit in some way, yes, the blood of Jesus Christ is that which brings about the salvation of mankind. But the question is, how does that happen? A religious world that professes faith in Jesus Christ would all admit that the blood has something to do with that, but how that takes place is the question, and when we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus is what we're going to look at for a little while this, no uh, this night. And so we want to talk about the beginning of that point, how is it that this is involved, by going to Hebrews chapter 10 and noticing the first few verses. We're going to come back to Hebrews 10 and notice the last few verses, verses 10 through 14, toward the end of this particular section. But I want to start out by looking at verses 1 through 9. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then they would have ceased to be offered. For the worshiper, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifices and, burn, er, and offerings, burnt offerings and offering for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. The overall point is that there were sacrifices being given in the Old Testament times. But that was not the ultimate thing that God wanted was just those sacrifices. They were looking forward to something in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Not the sacrifice of animals, not the other things that were there. But there was a point that was being made of Jesus Christ. The one who ultimately did the will of the Father then coming to be the sacrifice perfect for our sins. No bull or goat or anything like that did the will of God and was made perfect by that obedience to be the right sacrifice for us. That was something that Jesus did and that is what was being looked through all along. When we talk about the connection between the blood of Jesus Christ and our sin. We have to go to the connection between blood and sin to start with. When you look at the idea of death, death is that which is always associated with our sins. For instance, in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 17, the point was made of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. Well, we understand that in verses 1 through 6, of the very next chapter, Genesis 3, that they did eat of that, and in that day they died. Contrary to what Satan had said, they died spiritually before God as they were separated from Him because of their sins. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, I think everyone is aware of the fact all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And not only is that so, that all have sinned, that's the point of chapters 1, 2, and 3, Dealing with chapter 1, verse 18, and following that the Gentiles have been guilty of sin. And then in chapters 2 and 3, that the Jews have also been guilty of sin. And that has been so that there's none righteous, not even one. Well, what's the effect of that? The effect of that is, the wages of sin is death. So if all have sinned, then all are deserving of that death, which is the penalty of sin. But without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. When you look at Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 22, the statement is made, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. 
Why is it that there is no remission there without the shedding of blood? Well, it has to have something to do with that death penalty that is upon us because of our sin, doesn't it? When you look at that idea then, the question is, well, what's the connection between the shedding of blood and remission? What's the connection between the shedding of blood and that death penalty for sin? When you look at why that is needed, it's because blood is symbolic of the life. That is given throughout the Old Testament. For instance, notice this if you will. We're going to notice several passages in just quick succession. In Genesis chapter 4 and in verse 10, it says, And he said, What have you done? God speaking here. The voice of your brother, says the king. The voice of your brother, uh, your brother's blood, cries out to me from the ground. Now, how is that meant? It's obvious he isn't talking about the literal blood cries out. But the point is that blood, that life of your brother that you just murdered, that is something that's proclaiming that you've done wrong. It's an evidence of that. That life that was given is now by metonymy used of that blood. Your brother's blood cries out. You've taken his life. In Genesis chapter 9 and in verse 4, you notice something along the same line. When it says, but you shall not eat, uh, you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is, its blood. In other words, the life is the blood. Or when you go to Deuteronomy chapter 12 and in verse 23, the statement, only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life. You may not eat the life with the meat. So that blood stood for something. As God gave that place of blood, He made that, that that stands for the life of that thing that is living. In Acts chapter 15, you see the same thing used in the New Testament sense, that the blood stands for the life again there as well. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you, speaking of the Gentiles, no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. That point that is made, you need to keep yourself from blood, is not just a point of Old Testament law. He's not saying to Jews you do this. He's talking to Gentiles. You keep yourself from that blood. Why? Because it stood for, not in Old Testament law under Moses, but even predating that time, it stood for the life of that individual, whether it be of an animal or whether it be of a man. In Leviticus chapter 17, you notice the point being made here with pulling this together. If the blood stood for the life, then there's something being offered in the sacrifice, and that which was being offered in the sacrifice, the blood, stood for the life of that animal. In, Hebrew, or in Leviticus chapter 17 and in verse 10 beginning, And whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people, for the life, uh, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Why? Because that blood stood for the life. Now I had forfeited my life when I sinned. That was the death penalty. So there had to be a life that was given for that life. And God says, that's why I gave the blood. That animal that's offered in sacrifice, you must give of the blood that was there. We all recognize that under the Old Testament law, there were certain parts of that sacrifice of the meat that could be taken by the one who gave that sacrifice or by the priest, but the blood was that which no one had. It went to God, and we'll deal with that in just a little bit even more. But since that sin demands a death penalty, the point of it was the shedding of the blood was necessary as a consequence of sin. 
When God pointed out, here's what happens. You die when you sin. Then there had to be a life given. And the image of that in the Old Testament, the metonymy, the figure that was there, is that life is in the blood. Or the blood stands for the life. And therefore, with every sacrifice, the blood was offered of that unto God. When you look in the Mosaic Law, especially with regard to blood sacrifices, I just want to go through a quick reading of some of these and just summarize some of it a little bit later on down the line. But in Leviticus chapter 1, as this book is started out telling the Levites how it is that they were to give themselves in service to God in offering sacrifice and in teaching the law. He starts out in chapter 1 in verse 5 speaking of the uh, law about the burnt offerings there, the blood of the burnt offerings. He says... He shall kill the bull before the Lord and the priests, Aaron's sons, and shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Or if you go on over to verse 11, the point is made, he's to kill this uh, male uh, of the flock, a sheep, and the blood of that is to be seen. And each time you go through these, with regard to the burnt offerings, with regard to the peace offerings, and with regard to the sin and trespass offerings, the same thing is pointed out. Whether it is a bull or that which is uh, a goat or some sheep that was to be delivered or it had to do with a bird that was there that was given, in every form you had this animal, the blood belonged to God. That blood was to be taken in the one and poured on the altar or sprinkled with regard to the peace offering or that blood was to be taken and put on the horn of the altar and pour out all of the blood right there. When you see that, this point is very specific with what you always do with that blood. Why? Because if I'm going to take a burnt offering that is unto God, I'm offering that life to God of that thing. And therefore, that blood is poured out to show the full of that, even though a part of that meat might be taken by the one who was giving the sacrifice to the priest. It was always to be seen that that blood belonged there. That's how it was that this was offered and went up to God as that life going to Him. When you talk about peace offerings, how do you make that peace? How do you have peace between man and God when man is sent? There had to be a life that's given. When you talk about specifically the sin and trespass offering, always in chapters 4 through 6, over and over again, detailed points. If you take the blood, you kill that animal, you take the blood of it, you pour it on the horn of the altar, and then you pour out all of the blood, specified all of the blood that's right there by that offering. When you think about that, I want you to look at something in that and try to think, what would that be like? If you had to offer an animal every time you sin, every single time you sin, and you take the blood of that animal, and you have to put that there at the altar, how many animals will we go through in a month? Not only you, but your neighbor. All your family. These other ones that were there, you keep pouring out that blood. Not just this week, but next week, the next one, the next one. All of the blood that would be required is something that you need to think about that was there. What's all of that symbolize? The point is not only is that blood that's there, the blood's there because you let that blood after the killing of that animal. There's a lot of death associated with that. And not only is there a lot of death associated with that, there's a stench with regard to that. And there's something that you recognize in all of that. Here's what sin does. Here's what it keeps on bringing about. Every time I sin, here's this animal that dies, the blood's out there. And the sense of associating that sin with that kind of a letting of life, a taking of life a bringing forth of that which brings a putrid kind of a sense. That had to hit there into their mind. When I was a kid, my uncle that I'm named after, Uncle Harry, 
he uh, was one who had a meat packing plant. And so my parents always would have us go and do some things. I'd worked in the family dairy before that my dad had sold out his part in. But there was one time, well, you go ahead and you be with your Uncle Harry. I lasted for one week. I called Mom and Dad up and said, I, I can't take it. There was the killing of that steer or whatever else. There was the blood that was there, and it was my job to sweep that floor and the sawdust to kind of bring up that blood and by the end of that week it was the sickest thing I could ever have everything smelled on me like blood that's when I started thinking we had a class after that the next year in my age group in Bible class they started talking about all of the blood offerings and I could still smell that you still think about that you think about this that is something that God intended Israel to see. The effect of sin, he wanted them to get that. That when they sinned, there was life that paid for that, and it was associated with something that was not pleasant at all. And when you looked at that, you see people who recognized that even so, it still wasn't sufficient to bring about a, a forgiveness of sins. In Micah, that point is made in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, as the prophet says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will, I, uh, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? for the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. You see, there was still a consciousness of sin. This is someone writing under the Old Testament system. Now, when he talks about the fact, am I supposed to give this burnt offering, this sacrifice, this calf? And you're all, yes. Why? The law said that. But would any of that really bring about the full redemption of mankind? Or if I took my own child, my firstborn and offered, would that do it? You see, these people recognized the fact that if they did that, it was them who sinned, that individual. And the question is, how can God bring about redemption on this basis? We're going to talk about a consciousness of sin still existed, and that's the point. There was a recognition that the two things were not equal. And therefore, the question was, how is it that really this redemption takes place? They understood in their own mind that could not serve justice just by that. When you talk about the purpose of those Old Testament sacrifices, what was the point? Back in Hebrews chapter 1 that we just read a few moments ago, they couldn't make them perfect. That consciousness of sin was still there. They still recognized there has not been a full atonement take place. That blood was offered continually, but it still was something where another sacrifice and another sacrifice and another sacrifice was there. Romans chapter 7 and in verse 13 expresses it this way. The Apostle Paul, looking at that system, says, Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, he's speaking of the Old Testament law, it hadn't become death. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through that which is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. What did God have in mind to take away sin? He never had in mind those sacrifices to fully do that. That point is made abundantly in several New Testament books. The book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians talks about an eternal purpose that God had in Jesus Christ. God knew what there was to be of the ultimate coming, of that ultimate sacrifice, but He needed to get man's attention and to see him see, uh, get him to understand how terrible sin was. I tell you what, if I had to go out and offer an animal every time I sinned, or to pay for that and use up my money doing it, I'd figure out real quick that sin was a big problem. 
And then if I had to be involved in the taking of that animal and there having that life taken before me and smelling the stench of that blood from others having done the same thing and that go on over and over and over again through my year and through my years of life all the way through, I would have got the point. Sin's awful. It's ugly. It's putrid. And that is what God was trying to get them to see. That sin that it might appear exceedingly sinful. The horror of that was put to them. The blood or the life was the sacrifice. But in that giving of that sacrifice, someone had to recognize there isn't an equal value. When you look at all of the blood that was shed in all of that time, it still wasn't sufficient. Someone says, well, how are they supposed to see that? Well... Would it take a very intelligent person to figure out that if you had a bull or you had a goat or a sheep, that that was not of the same value as you? I've seen some good dogs, but I haven't ever seen one I thought was valuable enough to be one that's a substitute for a man. That's not the point that is there, that there's equal, equality in that sacrifice. They recognized in that sacrifice, that does not atone for me. It's not something of equal value. They needed to have something that would be there, that there had to be something of at least equal or greater value to justly forgive sin. So what happens? What happens is we see that ultimate price for forgiveness could never be some animal. There isn't the value in that. And so there was something more needed by the very point that Mike is making. That's his statement. There remains this consciousness of sin. As the Hebrew writer pointed out it, they recognized that could not take away sin. Never could, however many were offered. So what's the point? In Hebrews chapter 10, starting out with verse 9 where we left off, he takes away the first, meaning the first covenant, that he may establish the second, the second covenant. By that will, the new covenant, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministry daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin, but this man after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Those who are being set apart unto God and made clean and right in his sight. How is that done? It was secured at one time with the price that was paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. That happened so that men might appeal to that sacrifice from that time onward and even before that they might look at the value. Now, I look at a bull, I look at a goat, and I see, no, that's not the same value as a man. But now let me ask the same question. I look at me, I look at you, and I look at Christ. Is Christ of lesser value than man? Is he of equal value to man, or is he of a greater value? infinitely greater he was God coming to flesh and now as that greater sacrifice that infinitely greater sacrifice not only could he redeem those who were present in New Testament times but even to our time every man who ever lived has never equaled the value of Christ that's why you can and I can appeal to that value of that life that blood and through that, there can be this forgiveness of sins that is offered. Now, let's look here at Hebrews chapter 9 that deals with this in the sense of the sacrifice and Jesus offering that sacrifice of himself as the high priest who offered his own blood before the throne of God. He said, but Christ, uh, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect, tabern or more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, speaking of heaven, 
Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls, or the blood of bulls and goats, and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your what? Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. When I look at the blood of Jesus Christ, I can see how God justly forgives sins. There is the value in that sacrifice that I can recognize I see why it is. That God looks at the value of Christ, His offering, and on the basis of that, I am forgiven of sin. I want to make something very clear so that we understand the difference between that and Calvinism. Calvinism says what you do is you attribute or you impute to this man the righteousness of Christ, His righteous deeds. And then what happens is He's still a sinner down underneath. You just cloak Him with the perfect righteousness of Christ. The Bible doesn't teach that. In the imputation of his blood, the point of that is, he sees to that account that the blood of Jesus Christ can do what? It can cleanse. That's what the blood does. It cleanses us from our sin. Meaning what? Meaning his life made him the right sacrifice, whereby we can now appeal to him in his death. He did not offer that for himself. He did not need to die because of his own sin. But he came into this world living perfectly and we can, we can appeal to that sacrifice that he gave. And because of that, we can have the life that is in his name. Not his perfect works, but life in his name because of the sacrifice and the cleansing of our sin. The New Testament uses a word. The Old Testament Greek Septuagint used the same word with regard to a propitiation. You never find the word propitiation there. In the Old Testament Septuagint version, that's what's said of the mercy seat. Now let's remember something about the mercy seat. If you went into the first part of that tabernacle, that was the holy place. Then you had the most holy place. Only one person could go in there. That was the high priest. And as he came before that ark that was there that contained the Ark of the Covenant, there was the overshadowing of that with the cherubim wings. And there, under that overshadowing of the cherubim wings, that was the place known as the mercy seat. Why? Because that is where that blood came into it. That is what took place on that day of atonement when he offered for all of Israel. So you had that blood, which symbolically was the life, being given now to God there at that mercy seat. That was the point being made of that. In the concept of the propitiation, the Revised Standard Version uses the idea of an expiation. That really gets to the idea of what it effects. It does away with sin. But the real point of that word really has to do with that which is given in exchange for forgiveness. There is an action on both sides of that. In other words, God acts, but in that same terminology there is man that's acting in that being the propitiation for sin. So what is the point of all of that? When you get that idea of the exchange that takes place, look at that in terms of how the New Testament puts that in the use of that terminology. When you look over in 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 2, it says, And he himself, speaking of Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the world. There is the statement that Jesus is that. He provides that. Go a little bit further and notice over in 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 10, the point is made, in this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation 
for our sins. There is something there in being that, that he was made that and he came to us as that. He is a propitiation there. There's something that happens where there's a change from being guilty of sin to being forgiven of that sin and it has to do somehow with Jesus being there and the point is made that is what God intended with the whole thing. In Romans chapter 3, Romans, that should be Romans chapter 2, I believe. In Romans chapter 2 and in verse 25, no, it's chapter 3, pardon me. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, a statement is made, Whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. That point, God set forth Jesus to be a propitiation by His blood. Now here's what God gave, but what was the point of that through faith to demonstrate His righteousness? Man has a part in that to come to God in trust. God has a part in that in the bringing of Christ together. When you look at all of that, it's pretty obvious to me that what we have is something where there is a propitiation, there is a forgiveness, there is a cleansing that takes place. But why? The reason why is because we've now got the value of that life, that blood, and now here's man who has forfeited his life because of sin. And there is something that takes place of a meeting there. That word propitiation, when it's used in the New Testament, has the idea not so much of the thing offered as with regard to the action of that offer. In other words, here I go and I'm going to buy something that I've seen in the store that I like. That thing that I like is something that's $100, let's say. So here I go in and I say to the man who is out there, I've got $100, and I pull out a $100 bill. I said, see, I've got it, now give me that thing. What's he going to say? Say, no. What has to happen is you have to give me the money, and I give you the thing that you want. Nor do I come along and say, okay, I'll give you the money, and next year you can give me that that I bought. That won't take place either. What happens is there is an exchange that takes place there. There is a meeting of the one and the other, the price and the thing that is to be gained. What happens in forgiveness? There was a price, a provision that was made by the blood of Jesus Christ. It is of sufficient value to be able to cleanse every man of all time of all sin. But that can't possibly be done until that exchange takes place. There's something that I have to do through faith in coming to that. Now our Calvinist friends and our evangelical friends will say, well, that happens at the point of faith only. Or that happens when God gives me His irresistible grace that's out there. We're going to see what the Scripture says. Because if I can identify that point at which I meet the blood of Jesus Christ and that exchange takes place, that's the point at which I'm forgiven. That's the point at which I'm made right in the sight of God. So, when we look at that, we recognize that Christ died for all men, not just for some. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, He gave Himself a ransom for all. 1 John chapter 2 points out the fact, He gave Himself for the sins of the whole world. Calvinism says, no, it was a limited atonement. It's only for those who are the saved. No, He gave Himself for everyone. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, He tasted death for every man. That provision is there, universal in its need. Therefore, God has done His part in providing a sacrifice of a sufficient value for everyone who ever will be or can be redeemed. Yet the sinner doesn't have that until that redeeming takes place. Until there is something where he is involved through his faith to be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. So, at what point does he contact that blood? 
If I can figure out that, then I can know what it is. And all we need to do is go to the Scripture and see. Because the Scripture is very plain in that. In Romans chapter 6, in verses 3 through 11, he says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Now let's stop for just a minute. What does that mean is death? In biblical terms, death takes place and the blood is that which is given, right? No problem. The blood of Abel cried out from the ground. The blood is the life. So when there is death that takes place there of Jesus Christ, what we're meeting is that sacrifice of His life. Go on, it says, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism and the death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. I want to stop there for just a moment. It's very clear what's being talked about. Baptism is being given in what it figures. Here comes this man who is dead in sin. He comes to baptism, he's buried with Christ, meeting his death and raised to what? To raise to walk in a new life. We have been united with him in the likeness of his death. You see the point? There is a figure that is being given in baptism, and the figure is we're meeting the death, the life, the blood of Jesus Christ. Going on from there, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, he said, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord, or Christ Jesus our Lord. What happened here? What happened was, he says, as many of us. Think about that for a minute. He didn't say you, he said us. Paul is talking about himself here just as certainly as he is talking about those in Rome that he's writing to. He was one who Ananias told him, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. As Saul was waiting for Ananias to come preach, he was three days in Damascus. He had already believed in Jesus. He was one who was fasting and praying. There was repentance going on, and yet he was still in his sins. How do I know? Because it says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. He was still in him. At what point were those sins washed away? Well, Romans 6 says, as many of us, Paul and you folks as well, as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his what? Into his death. Into his blood. Into the giving of that life. Because that's the foreshadowing of what was there all through the Old Testament. We were buried therefore with him through baptism. We have been united together in the likeness of His death, he says. We then were raised to walk in newness of life. Our old man was crucified. Think about that for a moment. Our old man was crucified is a statement of what? Of the form of Jesus' death. He doesn't mean that we literally went through a crucifixion. We went through the death of Christ. We met the death of Christ. And when we did that, our old man what? Our old man was crucified. When? When we met the death. Is there a difference that takes place in water baptism for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ? Absolutely there is. And the reason is, it's because there I am manifesting that faith in the Christ, that faith in His blood, that faith in the sacrifice that was given, and that confidence that my whole life 
can be clean. My conscience can be clean in the sight of God. Why? Because I have the infinite price of the blood, the life of Jesus Christ that was given, Him not needing to give it for Himself, but Him offering to give that by His grace for you and for me. The body of sin then was what? It was done away. How would that work if our evangelical friends are right? My mother was Baptist. And she was told that she was saved at the point that she believed. Faith only. It was six weeks before she was baptized. And some of those that were with her were over six months. Now why did they wait that long? Their idea was those sins are already done away. They were done away at faith. But that's not what Paul says. Paul's point is, those sins were done away when? When we were buried with Christ and met His death, His blood, in baptism. He says, we are therefore no longer slaves to sin. And then he talks about them. He says, likewise, reckon yourselves. I came to this. So did you likewise reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. When did we come into Him? When we were baptized into Him, verse 3. When we were baptized into Him, what were we baptized into? His death. You see the point? You can't be in Christ without meeting the blood of Christ. And you can't possibly meet the blood of Christ without baptism being the point at which you've met the blood of Jesus Christ as an alien sinner. When you look at passages showing the result of baptism in the New Testament, it makes that point abundantly clear. When I'm over in the Philippines, we sometimes talk to those who are denominational preachers. And I always talk to them, I said, let's suppose, and I always tell them, I don't have this kind of money. But let's just suppose that I had the money to give you a car. And you can see every one of them. Face light up, not too many have cars over there. Let's just suppose that. And I see somebody that's especially grinning from ear to ear. I said, now let me ask you something. Would you like a car? Oh, yeah. I said, well, now which would you like? Would you like a body of a car or an engine? Which one? And they look at me like, what? I said, which one? One or the other? Well, they don't want one or the other of those. Why? Because it's obvious if you had the body of a car, you can sit there all you want to and you're going to go nowhere. If you have the engine, you have the ability to move, but you don't have any wheels to do it on. And I tell you what, it wouldn't be comfortable sitting on top of an engine box. You see, you have to have both of those together to really have something that is useful. Well, when we talk about baptism, is it one of those things that's essential? Or is it like our denominational friends say, faith is essential, but baptism is not? The only way I know to test that is to see what is associated with baptism in the New Testament. Well, I know that salvation is, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I know that from Mark 16, 16. I know in 1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the appeal for a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Now think about that in terms of what we've talked about with regard to baptism. Why does baptism say? Peter said, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not the physical rinsing or cleansing that takes place. But it's what? It is the appeal to God for a good conscience. Through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When does that take place? When we're buried with Christ in baptism, there meeting His death and we're what? We're raised to walk with Him in a new life. That's what we're appealing to God for. That cleansing of the conscience. What is the only thing that can cleanse our conscience? We remember back in Hebrews chapter 9. The blood of Jesus, Hebrews 9 said, is the only thing that can cleanse us from the consciousness of sin. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do that. Nothing else could do that, only the blood of Jesus. But where does Peter say we have that cleansing of the conscience? In baptism. Therefore, what do we meet? You see how easy that is? When I recognize it's there that we're cleansed from our conscience of sin, 
and yet the blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can do that, there isn't any other conclusion except to recognize that in baptism we have that cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. After they had asked, what shall we do when they had been pointed out to them, you've crucified the Son of God. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. There's one other place that that exact same phrase is present in your Greek New Testament. And that's in Matthew chapter 26. There, when Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, He said that it's done for, that blood is for the remission of sin. Our denominational friends say, oh, that means because of. You're baptized because there's already forgiveness of sins. Well, let's try that out. Was the blood of Jesus forgiven because people were already forgiven of sin? The blood of Jesus had to be given so that there could be that, because by the blood of bulls and goats, there was no remission of sin. He was looking forward to that and able to be able to redeem those of the Old Testament times and of New Testament times by those who acted in obedient faith unto God. Or how about when you look at Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, which we talked about, Arise, be baptized, and what? Wash away your sin. He believed, he repented, Saul did, but he was still in his sin. Baptism was looked at the point of when he was washing away those sins. We're baptized into the blood or into the death, as we pointed out in Romans 6. We walk in a new life when we're raised from baptism, and that body of sin is done away and we're made alive to God in Christ. That's all associated with baptism. Now, are any of those non-essential? Or are every one of them absolutely essential? Well, so far, every one of them have been absolutely essential. Therefore, baptism is essential. But we don't stop there. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, that idea of us being baptized is pointed out in what takes place there. When the Apostle Paul puts it this way, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's an interesting phrase. As many of you. As many of you as were baptized, that's the number who came into Christ. That's the number who put on Christ. Now, is that essential? Can we be saved outside of Christ? No. There is no other name in which we can be saved. We talked about that last night. Therefore, what do we need to do? We need to come into Christ. Would it be possible for us to be those who are Christ without putting on Christ? No. But what Paul says is that takes place in water baptism in the name of Christ for the remission of sin. Or when you look at Acts chapter 2, those who were baptized were put into that body. Well, what is that body? Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says, that was the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. God the Son. Purchase that body with His blood. When we are baptized, then we are brought to that salvation. As many as received this word were baptized. There were added to that number, those in Christ, that day 3,000. And that body was a blood-bought body. Is baptism essential? Yes. Because that's when I came into Christ. That's when I came into his body, and that's where the blood is. Or in Colossians chapter 2, I want you to notice this passage that states it ever so clearly. By giving a figure of an Old Testament time as well, of when one was made a partaker of the hope in Israel. It says, In him, speaking of in Christ, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. wonder when that took place. Verse 12, Buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. You know what? You can put that passage together and it ties every loose end, doesn't it? When is it that we come into Christ? When we're buried with Him in baptism. And when that took place, he says, you were raised with him through faith 
Is faith essential? Yes. When is faith seen? Faith is seen when I am obedient, he says, through faith in the working of God. Our denominational friends say, if you believe that baptism is necessary for the remission of sins, you're teaching work salvation, that man learns his salvation. No, I'm not. And Colossians chapter 2 points that out very clearly. There is a faith, there is a trust in God, and I come to Him trusting that He'll do what? In the working of Him, He will raise me from the dead. Why? 1 Peter 3.21 That as that appeal is made to God in baptism for the cleansing of a conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's what I'm looking to. I'm looking to the death of Jesus And the promise that His life was given for me, His blood was shed for me, and that as I meet that and show that I am appealing to His blood, His death, I'm raised to walk in a new life. Baptism is essential. Absolutely. In everything we see about it, we recognize the essentiality of water baptism for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. So what do we ask? God has provided for us through the blood of Jesus Christ everything necessary from His part for salvation to take place. Now what do I need to do? I need to respond to His grace. And that's what it was. It was grace. Without the grace of the blood of Jesus Christ, no one could be saved. That had to come first and be given for you and me. I need to then by that respond to His grace in being buried with Christ. I do that when I'm baptized into his death, and then I'll be raised to walk with him in a new life. You see how simple it is? Nothing difficult about it. What God was showing from the very beginning was how it was that I could come back to life in his name. He pointed out, if I sin, I die. Therefore, there had to be something that could make this dead sinner, you and me, to be able to be brought back to life through a resurrection that would take place, through a sacrifice that had sufficient value to bring about my redemption and yours. That took place in the blood of Jesus Christ. But my friend, if you're sitting there well saying, I'm going to take hold of that grace and I'm going to receive it by faith only, you're not going to receive it because you haven't had the exchange that takes place. That exchange that takes place, the price being applied takes place when you by faith are obedient to Christ. If you've never been obedient to Christ, that's specified when it takes place. When you come by faith, believing that He is the Christ, the Son of God, to repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be buried with Christ in baptism, you meet His death, you're raised to walk in the newness of life. Not because there's anything magic in the water but because there is something of absolute eternal value in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is then that you are appealing to God for the salvation based upon that blood. If you've done that, but you've left that path, you've gone back into the world, and because of sin, you're now stained once more and separated from God, then do as you see of Simon the sorcerer long ago. As he sinned, he was in the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity. What was said? Repent and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. Why? Because when the penitent Christian prays God for forgiveness, the blood of Jesus Christ is yet available. That's the point of 1 John chapter 1. And we can be redeemed as Christians based upon the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. If you need to respond to the gospel's call, And you need to do so and we can help you tonight. We hope you will while we stand and while we sing.